trickles through an hourglass to measure the passing of time. But to most of us, it isn't a few grains of sand or the hands of a clock or a shadow on a sundial that gives time a meaning. We judge it instead by an event in our lives, by an incident, by a twist of circumstances that far more surely than any mechanical device marks the boundary between what was and what's going to be. That event might be a serious one, or maybe it's colored with laughter, or perhaps it's a haunting combination of both. But take my word for it, you will recognize it when it happens. A few minutes, a handful of chuckles, a couple of tears, and somehow your life isn't quite the same afterwards as it was before. Thanks for the lunch, Doc. That's fine, Jimmy. I have a personal message for him. <clears throat> Here you are, son. Hello, Dad. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Doctor. Are you ready for our fishing expedition? Honest, Dad, I don't feel like fishing. Let's call it off. Now, look, son. I miss your mother just as much as you do. It hasn't been easy for me either since her death. I know that, Dad. Your mother was a wonderful woman. Tender and brave. Her last words to me were about us. I mean, you and me. She made me promise that we'd go on together just as we always have, and not waste time grieving about her. I can't help it. Well, I know it's tough for both of us. It made her particularly happy, though, that you and I had so much fun together. She got a great kick out of our weekly fishing expeditions. She made me promise that we'd go on with them. Well, can't we postpone it until some other time? Next week, maybe. Oh, Tom. Let me talk to him, alone. All right, I'll go upstairs and change. Sit down, Jimmy. I want to talk to you. You know, Jim, your mother was one of the best friends I ever had. I knew her all her life. I'm the one who ushered you into this world. I realize that, Doctor. I know how awfully fond mother was of you. And as for Tom Brady, well, Men just don't come any finer. He loved your mother very dearly. You know, he's been just as hard hit as you have. Yes, I guess he has. It's just as much your job to stand by him as it is his to stand by you. I'd never thought of it that way before. Well, I mean, uh, if, he, if he wants to go fishing, why, you owe it to him to go along. That's the way your mother would have wanted I have something for you, Jimmy. It's from your mother. It's a recording she made when she realized she might not pull through. And she asked me to give it to you a few days after she was gone. I don't know what's in it. She said it was for your ears alone. Here it is, Jimmy. I've got to be running along. My dear, dear son, Jimmy, when and if you ever hear this message, I will be gone. You and Tom are the most important people in the world to me. My greatest concern is for your future happiness. Please don't mope and grieve. You have most of your life ahead of you. Live it to the hilt. Now, 
There's one thing in my heart and on my conscience that I feel I must tell you. The man you've called Dad, for as long as you can remember, is not your real father. Despite the love and affection that I know exists between you, he's my second husband. It's only fair that you know who your real father is. Then if you wish to seek him out, that is up to you. Your real father is a very wealthy and influential man. Undoubtedly, he could do much for you if he wanted to. While he was not very honorable with me, he, he himself is honored and respected. His name is... Jim? Ready? Yes, of course I'm ready, Dad. I'm sorry I did like such a dope. Yeah, but as long as we stick together, they can't hurt us, can they? They sure can't. You know, it's a funny thing. As I was coming downstairs, I could have sworn I heard your mother's voice here in the library. Now, come on, get your things. wicked little girl, and I will not tolerate such behavior. How dare you? How dare you do a thing like that? Look at me when I talk to you. Bess, what are you doing? She's incorrigible. Really, Bess? Bringing in that horrid frog. It's dead. He was alive when I came in, but now it's dead. Why did you bring it in here, Abigail? I thought Miss Bess would like it like it. It's another of your impossible tricks. Go to your room. Yes, sir. I'm sorry it's dead, Miss Beth. You see how she deliberately taunts me? Butter would melt in her mouth. I don't understand this feeling between you and Abigail, Bess. She's out of place here. She's older, self-willed, not mixed with the others argumentative. She's upsetting the routine of the orphanage, and she's getting worse. Soon she'll steal something or hurt someone. She tried to bring you something, even if it was only a frog. You surprise me. You've shown such kindness to the other children. I have no favorites. What about Cynthia? Cynthia, she's bright. I'm trying to help her along. Perhaps Abigail resents it. I was an orphan, too. I had to make the best of things. Oh? Some of us got along. A few went to reform school. I see. I hope in the future you won't be too strict with Abigail. One more trick. Just one more broken rule and I'll send her away. I wouldn't like to see it come to that, Bess. I suppose you're wondering why I asked you here to tea, Bess. It's pleasant. I was wondering why I hadn't heard from you in two days. I did a little research. Research? Tell me about Abigail. Is she behaving? It would seem that way. She's being very proper. But I expect an explosion any minute. And that will be the last one. Bess, the research I mentioned, it was about you. About me? Yes, I... <laughs> I didn't mean to pry, but I was struck by something the other day. You're a lovely woman. I know you could have married... Really, Elizabeth? You were 11 when you left the orphanage, weren't you? You were older than the others, unloved, unwanted, always hanging back. You couldn't make any real friends, so you found them in the woods all about you. Like Abigail. What are you talking about? Come in. Excuse me, I was told I could find Miss Bess here. Come in, Cynthia. What is it, dear? It's about Abigail, Miss Bess. About Abigail? Yes, she's carrying out a cl clandestine affair. Now, Cynthia, we must be awfully certain of the facts before we make any accusations. But I am certain. Gloria and I saw her. I, I mean, we saw her put the letters in the tree. Letters? Tree? Sit down, Cynthia. 
Yes, she writes these horrible letters and puts them in that big tree down by the fence. And then he, her boyfriend, he comes along and gets them. She must sneak out and meet him after dark, but we've never been able to catch her. Now, really, Cynthia, you're making all this up. I can show you the tree, and there's a letter in it that she put there. Gloria and I saw her. Why not? Now, really, Bess, Abigail's only a child. She's almost 11. It's happened to younger girls than she. We must be very careful, Bess. Cynthia, you say you can show us one of these letters? It's in the tree. All right, we'll go and see. But, Cynthia, if there is a letter, it had better be in Abigail's handwriting. Glory and I saw her put it there. There it is. See, I told you. There it is. How on earth did she ever get it up there? With this stick. Well, what does it say? To whoever finds this, I love you. Well, the hourglass didn't change much while that happened. But it was long enough for the pattern of a life or two to go winging off in a brand new direction. And that's the way we really measure time, not by the flow of a few grains of sand, but by the flow of happiness and sometimes the sadness that make up life's little theater.